Great, thanks, Hugh. Um, good afternoon, everyone. I'm excited to be here today um, to talk to you a little bit about the importance of catalyst design and how we think about catalyst design broadly within the Center for CH Functionalization. What I hope to do today is just introduce you to the concept of catalyst design, talk to you about some of the things that we think about when we're designing catalysts from the ground up. And then also I'm just gonna highlight one example um, of catalyst design from my group at the end so I can walk you through how, um, how uh, we have developed multi-generations of catalyst as well. So, so, for those of you that are undergraduates, you might be thinking, you know, how do you even get started? You have a chemical transformation that you want to do. How do you know which catalyst to pick? When we talk about catalyst design, our ultimate goal is really to develop a selective and efficient synthesis of a desired product. And it's important to realize that catalyst design is a process that really involves using all the logical information available um, and applying that information to the selection and optimization of a catalyst for a specific chemical transformation. Catalyst design is iterative, and often you will see um, multiple generations of catalysts coming out of someone's lab or a, in a certain area of research. And the Davies group, you know, I think he's done a really nice job of highlighting they've been working in this area of dirhodium carbene chemistry for some time, and they have multiple generations of catalysts that have enabled them to get to where they are today. So each generation of catalysts can be studied, and um, we can get valuable um, information from those studies and we can use it to inform the, um, the design of the next generation of catalysts. And I wanna be really clear here that when we talk about information from a chemical process or chemical reaction, I'm not just talking about what are the products, did, you know, what are the yields, what are the undesirable side products, in the center, we have a lot of different people with a lot of different skill sets. So we look at things like kinetics of the reaction. We look at mechanistic studies. We use computation to inform our understanding of how the catalysts work. And we use all this information to feed back in um, and help us in the, in the design of the next generation catalysts. So within the CCHF, all catalysts are welcome, but we really have a few specific types of catalysts that we work with or focus on a little more than others. We're really interested in catalysts that can promote CC bond forming reactions. So this is when you start with a CH type bond and you end up with a new CC bond at the end. Um, again, the types of react um, catalysts that we use for these processes tend to be catalysts like the ones Professor Davies described that can form carbonoids. And then these carbonoids are reactive towards CH bonds or um, you know, uh, organometallic catalysts that involve metal carbon bonds directly. We also are interested in CX bond forming, and that can be, the X can be an oxygen species or a nitrogen species. And again, we can use metal nitrinoids to help promote that chemistry, or we can go through um, uh, traditional, more traditional organometallic reactions that involve uh, metal uh, carbon bonds. And then the other area that we're really interested in is promoting sustainable chemical transformations. And when we talk about sustainable chemical transformations, we may mean using electro chemical methods and, and developing catalysts that can actually function in electrochemical cells. So we don't have to use chemical oxidants to drive a process, but we can actually drive it at the surface of an electrode. And also um, we have an interest in moving towards catalysts that use first row transition metal ions over second and third row transition metal ions. And I'll talk a little bit more about that in a minute. So, when we start to think about transition metal design, what are the some of the considerations that um, you know that that we think about? So we really want to think about what is the reaction type that we're trying to promote? What are the key steps involved? And really to highlight, I, I have two recent examples from the CCHF I want to highlight. On the left, what you have is an uh, organometallic type transformation for CH uh, for C, that involves CH activation where basically you were using, um, in this example, they're using rhodium pi owl complexes um, to basically um, to carry out um, regio and enantioselective um, amidations on, um, on allylic substrates. And the selectivity in this particular example is actually, actually comes from the indenal ligand that is um, used coordinated to um, 
the, the rhodium center. And on the right, we have an example of, the, of a catalyst from the Davies group in which they're really using shape complementarity to control um, uh, CH activation. And I love this example because here we see a common substrate, but depending on the catalyst you choose, you can selectively activate one or another of the CH bonds in the substrate. And um, over on the right, what I have shown is um, really some, uh, some data that has come out, come out of modeling and collaborative projects uh, within the center that really shows you visually how to think about these catalyst structures. How are they wrapping around the metal? And how are they really controlling access to that um, rhodium carbonoid that is formed? Um, we also like to think a little bit about you know, how do you choose which metal ion um, that you're going to use? And when you're thinking about what metals might be appropriate for a particular catalytic transformation, you have to think about what are the redox requirements? Um, do we need to change oxidation state? How many oxidation state changes do we need? Spin states. If you are working on the first row, if you're working with first row transition metals, you have to be concerned about variable spin states. The second and third row metals, they tend to be a little, uh, a little better behaved. They tend to cleanly do uh, two electron processes. You don't really have to worry about high spin states because of the d orbital splitting. Um, Something else I always encourage students to think about when, when choosing metals for processes or thinking about catalytic reactions are ligand exchange rates or ligand lability at the metal center. Are ligands quickly exchanging at the center of at, at, at your metal centers or are there slow processes in terms um, of, of how ligands are coming on and off? And then finally, you need to think about the availability of your metals, their cost. If you want to use it in a massive industrial process, you probably don't want to rely on really expensive metals and their toxicity. And so when you look at the periodic table, it looks like, hey, if I'm working with transition metals, I have a lot of options. And you really do. The world is, you know, the periodic table is your oyster. But if we look at the graph on the right that really shows us um, about, uh, informs us of, of the earth abundance of different metals, what you'll notice is a lot of the metals that we really like to use in the center to promote our catalysis, things like ruthenium, rhodium, palladium, platinum, those are um, the rarest metals available on earth. So, so, so it's not cheap. If, if you're working with those um, metals, those are, are not inexpensive um, metals to, to work with. So ligand choice. Ligand choice is also really important when you're thinking about transition metal um, catalyst design. Ultimately, you're hoping, hopefully you'll end up with, you'll select ligands that are stable to your reaction condition. So if you're doing an oxidation reaction, you probably don't want a ligand that's really prone to oxidation. Um, it could be oxidized off your metal. So instead of entering a catalytic cycle, you'll only get one turnover. Um, so you want ligands that are stable to your re reaction conditions. You wanna think about how you can use your lig ligands to engender specific uh, uh, steric constraints around your metal ion that can impart selectivity. And it doesn't just have to be steric, it could also be electronic um, constraints can help impart uh, selectivity. And finally, you can use your ligands really to tune um, the electronic properties of your resulting transition metal complex. And um, what I have shown here is an example from the Davies group. And again, these are these rhodium carboxylate complexes. And what I wanted to highlight is the rhodium carboxylate um, core in all of these complexes is exactly the same. It's, it's, it, there are two rhodium centers with uh, four carboxyl bridging carboxylates hanging off. That is the same. Where the selectivity comes from is how, um, how they decorate or how they build up bulk off of the carboxylates. And I just have two examples here to really highlight that in the top example with this blue catalyst, what, what you see um, next to it is a space filling structure that really shows you how exposed that rhodium center is. You see that the rhodium center is fairly exposed. Um, and what we can imagine is that the carbene comes in, reacts with the rhodium, or sorry, the, the diazo forms the rhodium carbene. And then with, when that rhodium carbene is in that cavity, 
it, it, um, how substrate approaches is really limited by how the cavity forms around that reactive species. So again, they're able to get a great deal of selectivity, um, really using principles of catalyst design. And they also, um, you know, they, they look at product yields to understand how their catalysts are performing, but they also collaborate a lot with um, computational chemists and, um, and, and they also try to understand what other factors might be in, um, in play in, in achieving these high levels of selectivity. And so I wanted to, to pause a little bit and, and say, you know, it's not um, something that's important to keep in mind is, you know, ligands can be applicable to more than one metal type. And I wanted to highlight a really lovely example from John Berry's group at the University of Wisconsin, um, where they have taken an interest in these same paddle wheel type complexes, these metal carboxylates. And now um, they're using the same kind of core structure, but instead of working with dirhodium, they've actually decided to go after first row metal dicarb um, uh, uh, paddle wheel type complexes. And um, this example from 2019, they formed these um, cobalt complexes. Um, they also were able to use molybdenum and chromium, chromium as well. Um, but what's really exciting is in the case of the cobalt um, carboxylate complexes, they're actually able to get uh, uh, um, diazo reactivity and they can do cyclopropanation with styranes from these cobalt. So, so I wanted to highlight this because, you know, ligands can be used in, uh, uh, in multiple different situations. And I, I think this is a really nice example where we see one ligand type applied in multiple places. So I wanted to end today just with a really quick example from my lab in um, catalyst design. And I just wanted to talk you through uh, uh, the way that we approached a problem. So we were really interested in developing cobalt catalysts that could use dioxygen as um, the terminal oxidant. And uh, when we started looking into this, we were inspired that there was a lot of cobalt oxygen, cobalt complex oxygen chemistry known. However, none of it was really catalytic. Most of the, the studies that were published were really studied focus, focusing on um, the propensity for cobalt-2 to react with cobalt or to react with oxygen to form cobalt-3 superoxides, but those superoxide species weren't very reactive in catalytic transformations. So what we wanted to do is we wanted to know if we could take a ligand design strategy from nature and apply it to cobalt to make these system react systems reactive. So on the right, what I'm showing you is um, a copper containing metalloenzyme, galactose oxidase. And galacto galactose oxidase is a metalloenzyme that uses dioxygen to catalyze the two electron oxidation of alcohols. But what was really cool, what we found really interesting about this process is that the active form so even though the oxidation is a two electron process, the metal that's used in this process is copper and copper only cycles between one and two during this process. But what the enzyme does is it has a redox active ligand in the backbone that can also participate in the electron transfer process. So in this way, it gets over the one electron limita limitation that would normally be faced by, um, by copper. So our ligand design strategy was really, we wanted to design um, uh, a ligand system that would provide open coordination sites on our metal center. Uh, we wanted it to be, uh, uh, to have multiple coordination modes available to wrap up around the cobalt ion. Uh, we wanted to use amidates as our ligands and, and we wanted to use amides um, to coordinate because they're highly modular. You can change the R groups. I have an isopropyl um, shown in our, our first generation ligand, but you can change this to just about anything really easily. Um, when you change those R groups, it has a huge impact on the electrochemical profile of the resulting transition metal complexes. Um, amides are stable under oxidizing conditions. And because we wanted to do oxidation chemistry from these platforms, it was important that our ligand not be chewed up in the process. And finally, we incorporated these, um, ortholine phen these orthophenylene diamine backbone into our ligands because we know that those can, um, can be redox active. And we, um, depending on the metal, it, they, they looked like they were in the right range for the type of chemistry we wanted to do. 
So the first thing that we did is we prepared our catalysts, our, our transition metal complexes. And one of, one of the reasons I wanted to talk about this project in particular is this project was started many years ago in my lab by an undergraduate researcher. Um, uh, and he really did some of the first reactions that we did in the lab with these complexes. Um, and what he learned pretty quickly is that the ligand scaffold it can provide multiple different coordination complexes. So if we react the ligand with two equivalents of base, one equivalent of metal, we get a mononuclear species. If we use additional base and additional metals, we can actually uh, selectively form this diamond cord um, type species. Because we work with um, cobalt, these complexes are all high spin paramagnetic. So we often do rely on X-ray crystallography to confirm our um, uh, our complex um, structures. So once we had the complexes in, in, in hand, we studied the electrochemistry. And what we learned is that, you know, from the mononuclear species, we had multiple electronic uh, redox events available to us, which was pretty exciting. And then what we did is we, we looked at, um, we studied the stoichiometric oxidation of the complexes with O2 to try to understand what was happening. And one of the things that became very apparent in these studies is it didn't matter if we started with the mononuclear species or the dinuclear species, that both of these complexes would react with O2 and they would end up at the species you see um, that we call uh, C, but it's really the final product in both of these and uh, both of these reactions. And this final product was identical. Um, it didn't matter if we started with the monomer or, or the dimer, both complexes were going to the same species. And so we worked collaboratively uh, with Kyle Lancaster and John Berry's group to try to understand what was happening. And we did a variety of spectroscop spe spectroscopic studies. Um, we also did some DFT studies. And we're fairly confident that what is happening in these cases, whether you start with a monomer or dimer, is that you're ending up with a species that um, species number three down here in which the ligand rearranges. So you get one ligand, one metal, one um, superoxide type species. And so with these, with these, this um, in, in hand, we wanted to turn towards uh, catalytic oxidations. And we were really interested in the generation of diazo compounds using O2 as the terminal oxidant. And the reason for that is because traditional diazo uh, generation requires stoichiometric uh, metal oxide oxidants. So for every, uh, you know, every single molecule of hydrozone that you're oxidizing to diazo, you're generating an equivalent of waste. We really thought if we could do this catalytically with our cobalt system using O2, this would be a much greener process. So what I have shown here is sort of our um, optimization. And then I'll just add um, end by saying we have a, a pretty decent substrate scope with this transformation. Um, uh, we're really happy with the with the breadth of diazos we can generate. And with these results in 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 hand, we wanted to really um, continue to push this catalyst design. And so students in my group have been looking at increasing the steric bulk. And one of the reasons we wanted to do this is we wanted we wanted to really see if we could favor this planar coordinate or this, this uh, pincer-like coordination over the propensity for, for the complexes to form dimers. And we do see that this, this approach works. Um, this is a nickel example. We've also been um, moving towards different metals as well. Um, and the other thing that we realized in some of our studies is that we were actually getting some catalyst decomposition uh, through reactivity in the ligand backbone. And that shouldn't be surprising because the ligand itself is redox active. So when we go in and we actually functionalize that um, active position in the ligand backbone, we get control over the electrochemistry or the redox potential of the resulting complexes. So we can dial in um, you know, different oxidate oxidizing potentials just by changing these X groups. And so now we have a lot of different control over our catalyst, both sterically and electronically. And we're using these systems uh, to do some uh, nitrine chemistry um, and, and different types of oxidations reactions. So I just want to wrap up by saying that there are a lot of challenges that drive catalyst design uh, within the CCHF. 
We're interested in the factors that control turnover numbers and turnover frequencies. Um, we want to know wh which off pathway reactions actually end up killing the catalyst. Can those be present prevented? Can we do modifications to the ligand to prevent that? Um, you know, how do we move away from using rare and precious metals to first row transition metals to do these highly selective transformations? Um, how do we go about uh, identifying and optimizing new catalysts? You know, we're really interested in rational catalyst design and computational approaches. It would be uh, it would be really great to sit down at a computer and input the molecule that you wanna that you want to activate, and have the computer say, "Hey, start here. This is a you know this is this is the best catalyst for your transformation." You know, we've talked about making our catalyst. Uh, catalytic transformations more sustainable. We really need to um, move away from organic solvents and try to move into aqueous and acidic media. Um, we're also continuing to push on engineering metallo cofactors and enzymes uh, for new transformations. Um, we have engineers, uh, multiple engineers in the center, and we're, we're looking at supported catalysts. And finally, we're also interested in um, developing new reaction types. I talked a lot about CC bond forming and CX bond forming reactions, but you know there are other reaction types out there that, that would be of interest to the center, making CS bonds or CF bonds. And all of those um, challenges are, are in the, the front of our minds. So I just wanna really thank um, my group members, um, uh for all of their work on on this chemistry and um the cchf all of all all of my collaborators um and i'm happy to take any questions in the chat